Something's going to happen. Something wonderful. You love that doing that, don't you? There you go. Okay. G'day, fans, and welcome to another exciting episode of Talk Nerdy to Me. Here we are again, episode 21 this time. And to show how great last week was, we had all these people joining us like in the first 10 seconds. And now, as of right now, two. That's it. Everybody else has just bolted off and left, left us. So uh not very exciting <laughs> at all. But there's still plenty of... Oh, now we're up to six. That's a good thing. To, so who's going to be the first person? Good day, Michelle. Michelle's joining us from the start. She's had her nap from last week, and she's ready to party hard with the rest of us, which is the most important thing. As always, uh, we can't have a show without the lads, and I'd like to introduce my lads, Jeff and MPS. How are we tonight? <laughs> <laughs> I, I love Jeffro's face. It's like watching the White Hulk. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so that means we're going to have a bit of a, a, a chat about now, can't there's no way in the world I'm going to be able to um, be as entertaining as NPS, so uh, just be aware of that. Um, one of the things that I actually wanted to uh bring up was about uh, what was I say chatting to the other Mrs. Tilly of <laughs> very good Carol, well done. <laughs> uh, so there you go. Uh, uh, about Star Trek and Star Trek movies now. Um, I just wanted to sort of just bring this up as a bit of a natter because, uh, look, quite simply, I've been watching Star Trek Enterprise on TV uh, for quite a few months now, and I've got to admit, I actually really, really enjoy it. And when I sat and thought about it, and I thought, you know what? The series works, the franchise works as a TV series. It is just, it's really outstanding. Star Trek overall is a great show, right? It's a re each of the TV uh, franchises, I think, you couldn't really fault them as being like being any of them being inferior to anything else. Sure, they've got different concepts and different ideas, and there may be the odd episode that gives you the shits, but overall, the whole thing is actually pretty, pretty good. Uh, and it's it sort of reminded me of Doctor Who. Doctor Who has just always been a TV series. There's never been a movie except for the very first one back in the 1960s, and it's been very successful as that. And I sort of wondered, well, what if the Star Trek films didn't exist? Now, before I go any further, at the very start of this entire show, we were talking about the dentist, the uh, Jeffro's dentist dude, and even Greg King couldn't help himself and ask me, hey, is the dentist timeline set in the Prime or the Kelvin Universe timeline? Haha, <laughs> funny stuff. All right, let's move on from that, shall we? So I just wanted to get that out of the way. Um, so uh, for those who don't know, uh, obviously Star Trek uh, was a series in the 60s and they had the three seasons and all the rest of it, and then they had the animated series in the 70s, and they were going to produce a brand-new TV series in the mid-70s. They obviously thought that the world had changed. There was a lot of uh, popularity for Star Trek because of the conventions and the reruns and all the rest of it. It had been very, very successful, and they were going to do a new TV series. Prior to that, though, it was actually going to be a film called Planet of the Titans. So they were toying around at Paramount, let's do a movie, Planet of the Titans didn't work. We'll go to Phase 2. Phase 2 was going to be the TV series. All the cast had signed on except for Linda Nimoy. He was still a bit iffy about it all. Uh, and then, of course, in 1977, Star Wars comes out. Paramount go, oh, films are the way to go. The motion picture comes out, and we go from there. Um, and I'm just sort of curious to know, uh, what would it, the world have been like if the films never existed at all? Now, there's 13 movies, right? You've got the, the, the 10 originals if you will uh up to the end of next generation and the three reboots from um jj abrams and i'm just curious to say i'll ask you two um imagine if star trek just jumped from a tv series to a tv series maybe next generation um how what your thoughts would be about if the films never existed i'll start with you uh mps if you want <clears throat> well i think technically for me the films didn't exist because i watched the TV show when it, you know, the original series when it was on TV on reruns on on Sunday afternoons and that sort of thing and then there was next gen later on 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 the evening sort of side of things but I never really watched the films back then I didn't get into the films till probably the 90s or later so for me it just was a continuation from one series to another and the films had no impact and honestly it was the generation type films generations and 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 what were the other ones um can't think of them, but the next gen ones that actually got my my interest back in the original films. So I sort of went back again, I guess, with with those. Um, Aaron's right. Yeah, there would be no car. Yeah, exactly right. There would be definitely some quotes that we missing. What do you reckon, Jeffrey? Well, I'm tending to think that it would have been a very, very big dry spell. I mean, um, 
Star Wars fans are enjoying everything at the at the moment, and and poor old Star Trek fans had nothing. So the fact that the movies existed at least gave them something to be able to sort of enjoy and look at. So had the movies not existed, it who knows? I mean, whether Star Trek fandom would have held out until sort of uh, something like uh, Next Generation came along. I'm, I'm not sure, but I mean, the, the the movies are very important to us because I mean. It showed us that um, uh, people like Leonard Nimoy could actually direct, and he went on and had a, a very successful um, uh, career. And we also learned that uh, William Shatner can't direct, so uh, it it just meant that his career as a director was pretty much put on the back burner after that. So uh, it, the movies had some great redeeming features, and we're very thankful for that. Um, it's worth noting, I actually got into Star Trek fandom because of the films, right? So it's kind of funny that here's me saying, oh, do we need the movies? Where it was the movies that got me into the fandom in the first place. Without the films, I probably wouldn't have been there because I never really watched the original series when it was out, uh, being re-released in the 70s. And I like this comment from Michelle. Um, so it could work or without, but the, the you need the series. The series is the critical part. The movies are a bit of a bonus, if you will. I think if the movies were on their own, it just wouldn't work. Uh, and the series, all of them, is just so strong that uh, and, and the quality is so good that uh, you could actually bypass the films entirely. And I actually did a listing uh, here, and I'm just going to pull this up in a second, as to elements of the movies that made their way into the Star Trek lore further on down the track. Okay, so now this is... Oh, hang on, wrong button. Um, where are we going? Where are we going? Where are we going? Where are we going? Stream. Thank you very much. And give me my dudes back. Oh, God, God you're killing me, man. Kill me. Get there in the end. All right. Um, so I just want to discuss the, the films, and there were certain things that they added into the movies that made their way into future TV series. And in the end, it's actually not a lot, really, and you can almost ask, well, it's like, okay, well, what was the big deal? I mean, is there anything that's really significant that came out of it? So uh, I'll just do this in sort of like release order, okay? So you had the original series that came out in the 60s, the animated series, and then we started into the movies, right? So with Star Trek, the motion picture, yeah, you got the big movie, the release of the Enterprise gets rebuilt and all the rest of it. But there's only a handful of things that carried on onto future TV series. Now, I did this from memory, so there's going to be a few things that I probably do miss, and if people pick up on things that I've uh, made mistakes on, by all means, point them out. So in Star Trek, for example, the biggest thing, of course, in the movies was the first reappearance of the Klingons, right? Okay, the new Klingons have all been designed. They obviously re reappear in the next uh, Star Trek three. They've all still got the bumpy heads and the long hair and all the rest of it. And that carries on right through to the, uh, right up to even just, well, Picard, I guess. And, of course, in Enterprise, they make it, there's an episode as to why these guys had the bumpy heads in the first place. Because in the original series, as we well know, um, Gene Roddenberry really wanted the Klingons to look extremely alien, but there was no money for it. There's no budget for it. So as a result, they were just humans with, the, you know, the black moustaches put on and whatever else. But I guess this is a significant thing. If the films did not exist, how would the Klingons looked, especially Next Generation when War first appears, how would they have appeared? And you do sort of wonder what the impact would be. So I guess this is one thing where it's actually the uh, impact is actually quite uh, significant. Um, next up is now, I don't think this happened in the original series. It was the fact of Starfleet Command actually being based in San Francisco. I could be wrong. Someone can correct me on this. But um, at least we got to see Starfleet Command in San Fran. And that carried through even in Next Generation, uh, as we know, Picard revisits um um starfleet headquarters and you've got boothby there he's the gardener and all the rest of it so if i've got that correct so uh i guess that's one sort of thing that they added into the movies that now i don't know if it was ever referenced anywhere else but it was picked up on uh picked up and carried through uh in the tv series so i guess uh that's one sort of positive so if the films didn't exist where would starfleet command have ended up so you sort of do wonder about that um this is very, very, very subtle. In an episode in Enterprise, they make a reference to Colinar. Uh, it's the same this thing when they go back to Vulcan, and Vulcan is sort of split into two. You know, you got the people who are very um, the following the logical path, and those who are sort of a little bit not. And uh, I just thought it just sort of very, very subtle. They actually make a reference to Colinar, so just a very um, interesting thing that they noticed. Um, Star Trek: The Wrath of that was all I could think of from the motion picture, by the way. Yeah, uh, I think the big one you missed out is the Jerry Goldsmith theme that uh, carried over for Next Generation. Yeah, yeah, good point, actually. Uh, yes, the music, that's actually you're right, because had the film not existed, what it does make you wonder what the music would have been like in um, uh, in Next Gen. So, yeah, that's actually a very, very good one. So there you go. Um, just before I go, I'm looking at some questions here. Uh, would something... 
with something I've stepped on, filled the cinematic void. I don't know, Aaron, maybe it's certainly possible. Uh, but for the sake of this discussion, we're just working on the view that if the movies never existed, um, Colin said the movies did enhance the Star Trek universe. Yeah, I'm not, not denying that whatsoever. I'm just curious to see what would have happened had they not existed. So, Because uh, uh, it's actually a very interesting sort of discussion because later on in the 90s, you had both the TV series and the movies being produced at the same time. Star Trek, obviously Star Trek II rather, uh, the major thing was the introduction of the Federation new film, the Fed Reds as we call them, which make an appearance in yesterday's Enterprise in Next Generation. So you do sort of wonder, had the movies never existed and these uniforms never existed, how would the past have looked as far as Next Generation is concerned? Because if you jump from the original series to Next Generation and you've got that big gap in the middle and you go, well, okay, what happened in that timeline? What uh, what changed? Did the uniforms change at all? Or they just jumped straight from the original series version straight into the uh, next-gen version? Because when you think about it, this is a pretty radical change, um, not discounting what they did for motion picture. So it's a, it's a fair bit to sort of deal with. They go from original series to the, the skivvies to this, the Fed Reds, and then they go back to effectively skivvies again, if you will, um with the uh the jumpsuit so yeah, it was kind of interesting so um that was all i could think of star trek 2 so uh there you go um when we go to star trek 3 now of course the klingons reappear in this as you know with the bumpy heads and whatever else um the first appearance of a klingon bird of prey we know the romulans had them uh and the romulans of course had uh cloaking devices as well if i recall uh but the klingon bird of prey from this um, film ended up popping up all over the place in Next Generation onwards, so it was the introduction of the Bird of Prey. So had the movies not existed, what would the Klingons be flying around with besides their big-ass cruisers? So I thought that was actually quite interesting. Um, and even though it appeared in the second film, uh, the third film really dealt with the idea of the Catra, and the Catra is a big thing in an episode of Enterprise when um, Jonathan Archer has the catcher of the, the the Vulcan dude stuck in his head and they make a really big thing of it in Enterprise. So um, now, of course, in Star Trek II, the Wrath of Khan, I don't know if anybody actually knew this. When they did this scene, they actually didn't know why they were doing it. They just said, okay, we'll just do the thing with the Remember and then we'll just leave it at that just in case there's a, a future sequel and they can do something with it. And as it turned out, they invented the whole thing with the catcher and made a really big deal of it. So... Um, you do wonder how, if this thing didn't exist, this concept didn't exist, how would that uh, impact uh, future stories uh, dealing with Vulcan? So I thought that was actually quite intriguing. So it's mentioned in this movie and they directly reference it uh, almost word for word in um, Enterprise, which I thought was kind of cool. Um, uh, Mount Salaya, and of course, this is also referenced in Enterprise, okay, the big temple on Mount Salaya and on Vulcan, which is a bit of a big deal. Once again, Enterprise the TV series made a point of looking back at the movies going, oh, there's all these places and all these things we can reference. And they made a point of doing that rather than just ignoring it all. And I thought that that was actually quite interesting. So Mount Slayer is just mentioned very, very briefly in the in a particular episode of Enterprise. But I thought it was good that they did that. It just gets that link back. And uh, once again, had this uh, had the movies never existed, you do wonder if uh, it would have made any difference as to where they picked. Um, and, of course, the whole thing with the catcher transferal, uh, which in Enterprise is done very, very crudely. And in this movie, is done like as a really, really big deal. So that was about the only thing that was different. And uh, I don't believe the character who did it in Enterprise was supposed to be a young version of this person. So I, um, uh, there you go. Um, there's a question from Michelle. Uh, did Jim Cradley see his original or they just not get used? It's a sort of a combination of not just Gene Roddenberry doing all this stuff. I think he had a hand in it. Once the movies got involved, I think it was the production team that had a lot more say as to what was going on. Gene was very, very involved with the Next Generation TV series, but I don't know about the movie so much. So uh, uh, that's to the best of my knowledge. Others may know more. Um, and... <clears throat> Uh, and that was it. So in the Voyage Home, there's only, I think, one thing I could think of. The first time the Starships actually had a letter put after their name. Now, of course, that's really, really big in Next Generation, the Enterprise D, right? So if the movies never existed, right, not at all, what would the Enterprise be called in Next Generation? Would it just be called the Enterprise, right? NCC 1701, full stop, right? And, uh, and I thought that was actually really, really intriguing. And, of course, there's multiple episodes uh, in the next generation dealing with the Enterprise B, which pops up in um, gen movie Generations, the Enterprise C, which pops up in uh, yesterday's Enterprise. So I'm curious to know what would have happened if they if they never put the letters at the end of the numbers. Uh, would it just been another 1701, as in the next generation Enterprise, or what would they have done differently? So I reckon that's, that's definitely one for uh, debate. Now, to stop me talking all the time, do either you two have a thought as to what would have happened if the film never existed, then the lettering concept never occurred. MPS, start with you. 
Oh, look, I think someone may have thought about it and, and added it later on and might not have been a D. It might have been C or B or something like that, but I still think the lettering may have occurred. Okay. Jeffrey? I'm thinking they might have used the Funko Pop principle, you know, and sort of named it according to the mould that they used, so it, the number wouldn't have changed. Yeah. You do wonder, don't you? You could have had 1701, but it's clearly a different build of the ship, of the same ship. So uh, I do actually find that quite interesting. So, uh, but yeah, that's that's quite significant because the N7 CC 1701D we all know is the the next generation Enterprise. But I mean, had that letter not been there, you imagine all us fans going, "Well, which Enterprise are we talking about now?" Because there's you know there's multiple ones floating around. So uh, luckily for us. For the Enterprise Enterprise, they called it NX01, so they didn't even put the NCC in there. And um, there you go. And there's huge debates as to what NCC stands for, but we'll save that for another day. That was it. That's all I could find from uh, that film. Now, uh, in Star Trek V, there was nothing in there that cropped up that I thought, oh, yeah, this carries over to, the, not that I could think of, that carries over to the TV series in any way, shape or form. So we sort of move on from there. Um, GTX, okay. <laughs> uh, it was Star Trek VI, about the only major things that cropped up is the Kitama Records. That's obviously the big uh, thing about the peace treaty between the Klingons and the Federation, uh, and that does get referenced, I think, in future episodes, whether it be Next Gen or somewhere else, I think just barely or subtly. The, the word Kidma does sort of crop up, which I think is actually quite good, but that was a significant moment in the movies, and if the movies never existed, you have to wonder, well, what would have happened with this? So, yeah, it's the, the ultimate peace treaty between the Federation and the Klingons, and, of course, by the time this occurred, We've been watching Next Generation and the Klingons and the Federation have been at peace for years. So it's just, it's actually the timing was a bit sort of all over the place. Uh, and of course, the first appearance of Rura Penthe, which got mentioned in uh, Enterprise, was actually quite significantly mentioned in Enterprise because uh, Archer and that get, uh, he gets plonked into Rura Penthe, which I thought was kind of cool. That was a nice link back to this particular movie, which is kind of cool. And one thing I only discovered today, apparently from the new version of Star Trek, Rura Penthe was going to appear again. Because in the story, if you know it, Nero gets uh, arrested. Uh, he gets stuck at Rural Penthe, breaks out of there, and that's where he catches up with uh, Spock and all the rest of it. So they filmed it, apparently, as you can see here, but uh, deleted it. So even with JJ's version, they were trying to link it back to the original movies, which I thought was actually uh, kind of groovy. Um, and, yes, naval construction contract. Yeah, I think that's probably the most uh, accepted answer to that question. So there you go. Uh, St Stacey's asked, when did Star Wars start? Star Wars started in 1977. So uh, there you go. Uh, very good. Um, then we get into Generations, and nothing occurred in Generations that off the top of my head that um, sort of carried over to the TV series. And in First Contact, uh, clearly the first reference of First Contact with between Zeph and Cockrum and the Vulcans, and of course in Enterprise they made in the Mirror Universe, they made a point of saying, okay, we're going to reference this sequence again. So this was this event was referenced a few times, but it was good to finally see it. And I guess prior to the movie, um, or even since the film, it's it never got brought up again. So it's at least good that we got to see how that actually came about. Uh, even though the Zeph and Cockrum in this film was slightly different to the version we saw in the original series of Star Trek, who was uh, disfigured and um, not looking too flash. And of course, it was the first appearance of the Phoenix, the first warp drive ship, which ended up in the intro sequence for Enterprise. So once again, Enterprise really went back and referenced a lot of stuff that occurred in the movies, which was kind of cool because I don't think it occurs anywhere else in the TV series in the TV shows, Next Gen, Void, Design, Voyager. They may make basic references to it, but I'm not too sure where. So um, there you go. Uh, and, of course, it was the first appearance of the Borg Queen. Now, the Borg Queen popped up all over the place. We saw her again in Voyager, okay, and um, if First Contact, the movie, didn't exist, what would the Borg Queen have looked like in Voyager? Uh, yeah, that's that's a sort of an interesting one. They could She could look completely different. And I reckon that's actually quite an interesting one. So that's at least one area where um, the uh, influence of the film has been very significant over the TV show. Uh, and it was good for Voyager that they reintroduced the Ball Queen. And actually, for the most, I think in the last episode of that series, it's actually played by Elise Krieg, who uh, played her in the film, which is kind of cool. Um, Insurrection, I don't think anything happened in Insurrection that carried over to the TV series. So that sort of just came and went. Uh, Nemesis was the main one. Nemesis is a bit of a big deal, the death of Data, which, of course, is a big thing in Picard, okay? So Picard follows on from Nemesis um, as opposed to all the other stuff that occurs before. And so it was good that in Picard they said, yep, okay, Data died in uh, Nemesis. We'll definitely carry that through, which I thought was actually kind of cool. And, of course, it was the first appearance of B4, and B4 they reference in Picard as well. So they clearly looked at the movies and go, okay, this is a precedent that's been set. We've got to follow that, which I thought was kind of groovy. Um, 
And I just picked this up last week. It's the first appearance of the Remans. Now, for those who don't know, Romulus is a dual world. Okay, so the logo has the two worlds being held onto, Romulus and Remus. Most of the Romulans you see are from Romulus, but you've got the Remans. And in the film, they made a big deal about the fact that the Remans live uh, underground or in darkness all the time. And these guys featured just very, very briefly uh, in an episode of Enterprise, as you can tell, I've been watching it recently uh, that occurred last week, which I thought was kind of cool. Um, and I think that's it. Now, the things that didn't come up in future episodes, now I thought Genesis may have made a reappearance, not in the concept, but the mention of it somewhere in like Next Generation or DS9 or what, it just didn't get mentioned anywhere. Carol Marcus just disappeared off the face of the earth, big ma major scientist, never got referenced ever again. Of course, Picard got cloned in them in star trek nemesis that wasn't mentioned uh anywhere at all which i thought was interesting uh and i mentioned genesis uh even the nexus from um generations that went along and destroyed the enterprise b and whatever else or destroyed the front of it and killed kirk no one seems to sort of talk about that um and i thought that was actually quite interesting so it's a fair bit to absorb isn't it so there you go that's what my thoughts are so i guess in summary i'm trying to say the films are important but the world can happily exist if they never existed, if that makes sense. The series, the Star Trek series, all of them still work without the movies uh, occurring. So um, I think that's what I'm trying to say. What do you guys have to say? I was going to say, would you consider that some of the Star Trek movie scripts might have been ideas from what they would have put in the show anyway? So because they didn't have the show from 68 to next gen, um, you've got nearly 20 years that people are sitting there still writing stuff for it um, and that maybe some of the ideas would have come along if there had been another series because they would have expanded on what the movies may have been what they conceived to be, if that makes sense. Yeah, I would love to have seen what Phase 2, the Star Trek series of the 70s, would have looked like. Had the original cast back, as I said, without um, uh, Leonard Nimoy, he was a bit iffy at the time, they had another actor signed on signed up and he was going to play a character called Zon, X-O-N. Um, and it was a similar character who appeared in the motion picture who then got bumped off in the transporter accident. And I think it goes to show that the films, excuse me, were entertaining. They had their place. Not all of them were successful there. As you know, the old gag of every second one was the great one. Every third one was, was the failure. Um, but there were examples like Insurrection was a classic example. It's a major motion picture. And you look at it and you go, well, what was the point of that? Right, it's just a big ass, expensive TV episode. We didn't achieve anything. Did nothing came out of it. Generations, the mixture of the old and the new, sort of like, oh yeah, okay, you know, does that sort of work? And even though, like with Star Trek Two, which a lot of people class as the most of the best of all the films, if Khan never reappeared ever again, who would have cared? Who? who what difference does it make? He gets stuck on t uh, City Alpha Four, and he just gets left there, and he gets forgotten, and that's the end of that. So, I would like to have seen what a TV series. Would have looked like um because as we found out when next generation was released um the show really picked up uh its game and was massively successful and it works so well as a tv show and it does as a series of movies the movies are a good two-hour fix but in the end they're a bit of a take it or leave it thing you don't really get a lot out of it i mean they kill off spock in, in the second film and they bring him back in the third film and you go well it was a bit pointless wasn't it so yeah i don't know um and, uh, yes, Michelle, you are being cheeky about mentioning about whether we're talking about the Kelvin timeline. See, the new reboot movies pretty much are all in the new timeline, so that's why I didn't really include them. So uh, there you go. Um, Genesis was mentioned in the episode, The Amiga Directive. Uh, where was – which uh, series is that? Daniel, can you just tell me? Was that um, – yeah, if you can just tell me, that'd be great. Um Star Trek's anywhere in wider collars. Haven't watched the Next Generation movies in over 15 years. Yeah, well, William, uh, yeah, the 15, aside from First Contact, um, they're pretty ordinary, really. Um, Nemesis, you can sort of take it or leave it. Um, as I said, Insurrection wasn't very, very popular. Um, First Contact was about the only one that sort of made a, a big impact for a lot of people in the fans. So um, there you go. Um, this is a good question, actually. Uh, all good things. The final episode of Next Generation would have worked well as a film. That is a very good argument because All Good Things was an excellent uh, episode, actually. So uh, there you go. Okay, very cool. Okay, so uh, hang on, I can't remember. Hide. Um, okay, so they did mention Genesis and Voyager. Well, that's cool. That's good that it did get mentioned somewhere because imagine you produce a product that can um, transform dead planets into living planets 
And then you get to the next generation timeline and no one ever mentions it. No one discusses it. Immediately it was a secret project. Yeah, okay, we'll got to allow for that. But you think someone somewhere would have said, okay, we, we screwed up the first one, but hey, we'll just restart the project and, you know, just try and fix up the flaws and, you know, it's the, the positive that way, the negative. So I was really surprised it never just got mentioned anywhere else. So at least got mentioned in Voyager. So uh, that's good to see. So, um, yeah, but uh, overall, I think, yeah, Star Trek, is a, as a TV franchise is outstanding and um, hopefully it has a long and a healthy life to come. So there you go. Very, very, very good. Anything you two want to mention before we sort of start to wrap this up? Yeah, the only thing I can really think of is that because a lot of the uh, the fans that uh, came out of the original series and, and particularly uh, the movies ended up working on the TV series in later years, I think that's why we're getting uh, a lot of these great references because – these guys are the showrunners of, of Deep Space Nine and, and Next Gen and Voyager and all that were those fans that were taking all that movie stuff in and going, hey, you know, I can incorporate that into my scripts. So uh, I think that's been where the real benefit of, uh, of, of fans working on shows has, uh, has resulted in this sort of uh, nice little continuity. Mm, cool. MPS? I'm just curious. If, if they... Re- reduce the number of seasons for a series but had more of them which you know so say they did the 60s that they did with three then they did phase two then they did say five seasons of next gen not overlapping with voyager and ds9 and all that sort of stuff but if you sort of had a new sort of series every decade almost um you could probably incorporate most of that film stuff in there or it would probably come out so I don't know. Hard to tell. I mean, a lot of people actually argued uh, when the best of both worlds came out for Next Generation, the conclusion of season three, a lot of people said that should have been a film because it was like it was the real high point of the show, right? The show had like been sort of got through its first two seasons and the third season it really kicked a high gear and finished with the best of both worlds, the ball coming in and doing their thing. And a lot of people said, oh, that should have been a movie. That was just fantastic. And I think there's a, definitely a school of thought that says multiple episode arcs uh, for any of the series have just been extremely popular, yet they seem to work really well for the small screen, for the TV screen, rather than saying, oh, let's just push it up into the cinema. And uh, it's sort of sort of interesting. I mean, it's all this is all just like pie in the sky stuff. I mean, the history is what it is and the movies exist and it is and, and so be Jedi. But I think that if you were to say with someone in the future, what do you remember about Star Trek? I don't think people would say, oh, the movies. Oh, I love the movies. They were the ants, pants. They were the great. That's what Star Trek is. And then secondly, oh, it's a TV series behind that. No, no, I think that people always think of the TV series first. It's like the movies are just a, a bit of a bonus, a bit of an added, um, you know, a bit of spice, uh, a bit of sugar on top, if you will. But you don't need that sugar on top. If you take it out, everything still just chugs away as per normal. So uh, there you go. Very good. Um, uh, bye, bye, bye. Hang on, there's a couple of comments here. Lower Decks, yeah, yes, you're right, uh, Aaron. Uh, Lower Decks does make a lot of references to the original stuff about the Dr. Colvin timeline. Yes, we discussed that uh, in, in the recent past. Interesting, though, watching you guys talk so much fun. You learned so much. Uh, Stacey, uh, you're learning stuff, are you? Uh, I like this one. Um, we, you learn so much. The thing is, is whether it's worth learning. You know, a lot of the stuff that we're talking about is complete shit, right? You, you, if you want to purge your brain after you're finished with us, except maybe MPS's uh, talk on uh, pop vinyls, uh, then you're more than welcome to because a lot of the stuff that we talk about is uh, a bit of tripe in the grand scheme of things. So there you go. Uh, and that's a good one, Colin. Uh, the Kobayashi Maru, instead of being in – it's never been mentioned anywhere else that I'm aware of. I mean, they may have mentioned it by name, but that you don't actually see it occurring in any of the TV series. That would have been quite good. So your Kobayashi Maru um, scenario uh, on DS9 or Voyager or whatever. Um, yeah, that's that's actually quite a good one. So very, very, very good. Um, Claire said she'd like to have a Starfleet Academy series. A lot of people have actually asked for that. And there was mm-hmm. a, whenever a new series is being brought up, people think, oh, I hope it's a Starfleet Academy one, but it never is. So, uh, uh, yeah, that's what uh, Claire said there. So... Uh, he's hoping, I suppose. So uh, there you go. Very, very good stuff. Uh, right, I think one turn to drum being terrorized for years ago. The mind parasites. One of my. Pa- oh, here we go. Um, there you go. So. Uh, one turn to drive in being terrorized because of the mind parasites. What were the parasites called? Do you, did you two know? I'm I'm thinking the bucket of chicken, probably. <laughs> but- <laughs> 
<laughs> no, exactly right. There were the city yield, actually. So uh, there you go. Because, yes, very good. All right. So we're going to, uh, yes, uh, Colin, we're going to hold back the discussion of the, the year 2010 till next week because we're way in, well and truly over time now. So there you go. Anyway, hope you guys have enjoyed the show. See you all next week. Don't forget, forget the curfew. Stay here with us. Just because you can go out an hour really doesn't mean a damn thing or an hour longer. Uh, so there you go. All right. So we're going to buzz off. And uh, as always, lads, what do you reckon? Stay nerdy. Stay nerdy. Stay nerdy. Okay. All right. See you next week. <laughs> Bye.